Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org consequence and the consequence podcast network thanks as always for making your way here of course uh checking out the series uh, i do hope you hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all the interviews that i put out uh, three interviews every single week it's a new one every monday wednesday and friday great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover those new ones you can do so anywhere in podcast land uh, including spotify apple podcast at npr wfpk.org consequence or, of course, right here on YouTube for the video versions, anywhere you get your podcast from. Subscribe to Kyle Meredith with. That's me, Kyle Meredith. Today, we get to talk about the new Goosebumps series on Disney Plus and Hulu. In fact, uh, today I'll, I'll be joined by uh, Isa Briones and Anna E. Pui uh, to uh, to talk about. So it's, it's not, I guess it's a reboot. Uh, only in the sense that there was a series, of course, back in the 90s, uh, coming from the R.L. Stein books originally. Uh, there was the movies with Jack Black uh, back in the 2010s. Uh, now this is a fresh take. This is a whole new take. It's even a bit more adult than they've ever been. So we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about uh, about their relationship with the books, of course. We'll talk about the nostalgia, trauma, uh, inherited trauma, especially. Uh, and of course, we're also going to get into the soundtrack, this series as one of my favorite soundtracks right now, it's almost completely 90s. Uh, you get bands like R.E.M. and Nine Inch Nails and Soundgarden and Radiohead. You get Courtney Barnett's and Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. We'll figure out how it all bridges together. All that and more as we're talking Goosebumps on Disney Plus and Hulu. Hello. I, I'll say what I know everybody says at this point, but uh, I've had so much fun watching the series, uh, this new Goosebumps series. And I didn't know that I would, by the way, because... It's one of those things, right? Like this is this is not the first time it's been, you know, the television version and and the movies. I would love to hear from both of you all, you know, coming into this knowing that there's a history with this. What did you all think of this? I mean, what what fresh take did you think that you could bring? Which, by the way, all the compliments because you completely did. Uh, uh, Issa, I don't know if you want to start with you. Yeah, um, for me, when. Uh when I first saw the, the, the sides for the audition and the script, I, I mean, well, first I found out that I was auditioning for Goosebumps and I had the same thought that you did where I was like, this could go a number of ways. This could be so cheesy and so just wrong, or it could be incredible. And thank <laughs> God I read the script and I was like, Oh, this is different. This is, different for for Disney plus too I mean the fact that we are handling some quite adult or or at least themes that teenagers are going through that aren't always talked about and I feel like that is so important um but yeah reading it I was just like oh this is a goosebumps that you've never seen this is not your mother's goosebumps <laughs> this is uh very new and the fact that you're also dealing with five kids that wouldn't necessarily be friends I wouldn't you wouldn't see them at a lunch table together like that you're bringing these people together and it doesn't have to be some weird like statement about it I mean the fact that there is a black jock and a an out gay man and their best friends and that doesn't have to be this big joke or anything it's just that's how it is because that's how the world is and that to me was so telling I was like oh this is this is on the right track of telling a story about teenagers today and also connecting to the original fans of Goosebumps who are in their 30s now and like that it, it really spans all of those um viewers yeah absolutely and I think with any franchise right as an actor especially one as beloved as R.L. Stein's Goosebumps you do feel this pressure whether you want to or not this responsibility to be authentic and keep the integrity of the original stories. And I think what Rob and Nick and Aaron and all of our incredible producers did with these studios was create our own version of allowing this to be a nostalgic coming of age ode that is inspired by the OG series and still have a new fresh take, new lore, new evil, new curses, new monsters. I grew up reading all of the books, so did Issa. And of course it feels insane to read something when you're little and then put it up in real life and play pretend and and get to live in that world it's it's the biggest blessing but I think that they just found a really successful balance of 
heart and courage and friendship and adventure and mystery and scariness with the kind of silly, quippy, young, frightening aspects that we love about the books too. Yeah. Yeah. If you grew up on the books, as a, a lot of us, you know, reading them, like, do you have to separate yourself a bit from that when you're coming up with your character, when you're finding that character? Are, are you allow, are you, do you allow yourself to kind of throw back to some stuff? I mean, how, do, how does that work for you all? I feel like they came up with really brilliant ways to give Easter eggs to the original series. Um, it was very clear to us and it was told to us that this is not a carbon copy of the books, nor is it a carbon copy of the version that was already done uh, prior to ours. So they really gave us the freedom to kind of create these characters from the ground up. But I think with each episode being kind of inspired by one of the books, that in and of itself has so many delicious like secrets that if you are a fan of, you can absolutely find. Um, but I mean, I can't speak for you, Issa, but personally for Isabella, I tried to make it quite separate from the original Haunted Mask and come up with a version for an audience now and what felt authentic to the story that was currently given to me, not trying to recreate something that had already been done. I think, yeah, for me too, it was in a way easier to not lean on a book because Margot's episode isn't as specific as everyone else's. Like, say cheese and die haunted mask cuckoo clock like you you know those specific stories but for um margo's episode it's it's reader beware and for that it kind of spans all of those choose your own adventure type books and you can really and in that way like it's built into the meaning of it it's choose your own adventure like i i can kind of build as i go um which i think was really exciting about that episode it's and I think leans into Margot's character a lot because she's very much an observer. She's trying to figure everything out. She is is watching and that is the uh, reader beware. She's just fully watching her mom in the 90s and just gathering all this information. And that I think is kind of so easy to just play with because I just get to watch everyone and then form my own opinion slash Margot's opinion. Uh, Isa, um, one thing I laugh at, and as I laugh, as we all have laughed at things like this in, in movies and shows before, you find yourself in a love triangle. And mm. and I think at one point, you know, you're going, how in the world do, would anybody care about any of the relationship stuff when you're being chased by a ghost demon at this mm. point? But yet. <laughs> no, it is. It's kind of uh, crazy. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, though, isn't that how it always is, though, like in, in yes. real life? When you're going through the most intense parts of your life, that is when you are leaning on the people around you and creating the deepest relationships because you it's so unexplainable what they're going through. They have to lean on each other because they're the only people that know what is going on. And I think it makes sense also they're teenagers. Of course they're falling in love. How many times were you in love when you were a teenager? God. <laughs> It's really interesting. It feels frivolous on paper. It feels trivial to talk about love and, you know, a delicious love triangle in the middle of, you know, someone trying to take over the world and kill us all in Port Lawrence. But also we're trauma bonded. As the five of us, we are going through things that you can't even fathom is happening right now. And of course, I mean, I think that's what's so beautiful about Margo and Lucas's relationship is and all of our relationships really is it's it's quite unexpected and this really shouldn't happen this way but because of the way the situations went down and the order of those events you find yourself in a precarious situation and you know personally i am as an actor i am team margo and team lucas i'm team margo lucas and team isaiah isabella but my real team in my heart is Is isabella and margo Yes. That is the team that I think would be the most successful. They would take care of each other. I would protect her and I would make sure nothing happened to her. That's a You hear that, Lucas? <laughs> <laughs> season two, y'all. Season two. Yes. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, when you talk about the trauma bonding, um, it is interesting because because when we hit the psych out on, on episode eight, I mean, usually... 
here's where things end. You know, here's where it rarely do we get to see how characters deal with the trauma after it's happened. You know, the horror movie ends and then we're done. Yeah. But but this this takes a lot of things that you might see in a second season. You guys start to take care of right away. Did you all see it that way when you read it, when, when you when you you know, when you were when you were doing it? I mean, when I read the end of eight, I I thought season finale. Yeah. This reads the season finale. It I have no idea where this could even go. I I was thinking to myself, right, is if Slappy is our antagonist, we have this evil, these curses. Biddle seems to have been resolved. He's with his parents now. Where do we go? Slash, how exciting is it and how interesting is it to watch? the kind of downfall that happens, not even the downfall, but but the consequences of that kind of traumatic situation. And I think, you know, Will Price, who plays Lucas, did an incredible job of showing how some of us aren't actually able to move on as easily as others. And Nora still clearly has his PTSD and, and we're kind of trying to get back to normal. But I think that nine was a really nice way to establish the growth of our relationships and kind of show the character's arc um, the characters' arcs that we've been uh, taking in the journey they've they've gone on. Yeah, I mean, it's very much a story about. I mean, at its core, we're we're really tackling like, what do you, what trauma do you inherit from your parents? What is like built into you, which is a very timely conversation to have. And I think then you get to see people grieving in different ways. People that and that is so important a very important conversation because it does not look the same for everyone and you see it within the cast there's lucas who cannot move on margo who's trying to run as far away as she can like there's and and that that's that's the human experience you're trying to figure out how to deal with the craziness of life um outside of monsters and demons um but i think that's kind of what the end of the show, uh, what makes the end of the show so special is is showing the aftermath when, like you said, it usually just ends that we solved it, but right. no, it's never fully solved. It felt really did feel like a gift as a viewer to kind of go yeah. to that point, which by the way, the yeah. other gift, and uh, going to be no surprise that I bring this up was the music in this. Um, because oh my God. R.E.M., Courtney Barnett, Nine Inch Nails, Yay as Elastica, Radiohead Sound. And of course, I'm naming a lot of my, you know, 90s no. heroes right there, too. The 90s music goes so hard in this show. When we, because we didn't even know, there were some inklings we could tell, because we have um, a lot of people on the team that started in music and are very um, music focused. So we knew, like, okay, this is going to be good. Um, but then watching it once we first started getting to see little bits of episodes and just seeing how we know what what work we did but to see it with the music with everything and how well crafted that is and we were like okay so disney spent their budget on the music <laughs> okay right. it was those rights and and i was so so happy with these kind of punky songs these rock songs these eerie pop songs it doesn't feel predictable. It doesn't feel basic. And I think it's so easy to fall into that when you're dealing with young adults or teenagers. And I think the soundtrack perfectly blends the Gen Z millennial line of yeah. people who grew up with the series in the 90s and people who are watching it now thinking, wait, that's a sick song. What is that? And then you have a conversation with your parents about music and it's great. Yeah. No, it's great. my mom freaked out at the REM song. She was she, she saw the episode away from me. She calls me and she goes, REM! And she just screams. <laughs> Please. I love it. If it's one of those, if they put it out on vinyl, I'm going to be buying it. And I already yeah. own every one of those songs anyway, because that's, yeah. you know, that's how it goes. Um, I love the story and I, I especially love how it ends. You guys, uh, you feel like there's a lot more story to tell here? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, you know, our fingers stay crossed for a season two, but I mean, there are so many Goosebumps books to pull from and also so much rich um, storylines within the story we've already made and the the characters and the relationships we have. There's like so much room to grow but you know we just stay hoping <laughs> I think the last episode really brilliantly presents the idea of of just kind of the human plight 
and how you will just do anything to get what you want. And that kind of is the basis of all of R.L. Stein's brilliant books is, is these people are curious and curiosity kills the cat, right? You can't not pick the mask up again. You can't not wonder what if I just say the spell and, and bring Isaiah back and then it'll be fine. It'll be fine. But there's always a consequence, the karma of it all. I think um, in a dream world, if season two happened, we could explore so much of that, of that karma, which I think would be so exciting. I'm hopeful for it. Thank you both so much for doing the work you've done. And thank you both so much for taking the time to talk about it. Thank you. You thank too. You. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.